Amen. Titus chapter number three. There's a, a chapter in the Bible that just it maybe doesn't get enough attention that it, that it should, in my opinion. But uh, look at Titus chapter number three. Um, just keep your place there and keep a bookmark there, keep a finger there, whatever, and go to Galatians chapter five. We're continuing the Fruits of the Spirit sermon series this morning, and we're going to look at another one of these. I'm really enjoying this sermon series. This sermon series is showing us Galatians chapter five and verse number 22 and 23 on how we should be known as Christians um, the characteristics that we should strive to have. And it's kind, of a, it's kind of a measuring stick for us as Christians to tell us whether we're in the flesh or whether we're actually following the Holy Spirit that God has literally given to us to carry through our physical lives on this earth. He's not only given you salvation, but he gave you this helper. He gave you this down payment, this earnest of the Spirit, the Bible says in Ephesians. But look down at Galatians chapter 5, 22, and let's look at which one we're going to focus on this morning. The Bible says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. So this morning we're going to look at this idea, this fruit of the Spirit of gentleness. We're going to look at gentleness. And you say, well, gentleness, what in the world? All the guys are like, Ugh. you know, they don't want to be known as gentle. But look, that's a fruit of the Spirit, that you are supposed to be someone who is gentle. So what is gentle? What does it mean? So it's, it could be either a verb or it could be an adjective. An adjective, remember, describes something, right? It describes a noun. So the adjective, which is the most common, def, common use of the word gentle, is to be moderate in action, in effect or degree, not harsh or severe, all right? A verb is, is to, you know, if you, you know, gentle, you know, a verb would be to calm or to pacify, right? Um, the use of that word. But it's really an adjective to describe something or really somebody here is what we're talking about in the fruit of the Spirit. Now turn back to Titus chapter number three and look at verse number two. So we should be gentle. You say, I don't want to be gentle. I want to be, you know, a tough you know, I want to be a tough man, and I want to be this manly man. Look, look the, the two things are not exclusive. I'm going to show you that this morning, all right? Look at Titus chapter number 3, and look at verse number 2. So the Bible in Titus chapter number 3, so Titus chapter number 3 is kind of giving us this idea of it's not really the fruits of the Spirit. It doesn't describe it that way, but it, it's kind of telling them, like, hey, you used to be like this. You know, all these, you know, people that were striving and hating each other and all this stuff. But you should be like this now that you're saved. Again, you should be like this. You should have the fruits of the Spirit. It's not like you're going to get saved and like the Holy Spirit just takes over your body and you become like they wouldn't even need Galatians chapter number five in the Bible if you just became some robot. If Lordship salvation was true and the Holy Spirit just controlled you and took over, we wouldn't even need you know, this direction on the fruits of the Spirit, because the Holy Spirit would just take over and we would just have those fruits, right? But the Bible is trying to tell you, you've been saved, not through your works. Could you please do what God is trying to help you to do? Could you please follow what God, could you please love God and follow his commandments, do what he wants you to do, act like he wants you to act, and he's giving this guide inside you, which is the Holy Spirit itself, to help you follow that. And here's a gauge that if you are, you know, how do I know if I'm following the Spirit? Because if these things describe you, you're following the Spirit. If the things in the verses above describe you, you're not. All right? It's not rocket surgery. I mean, the Bible's just laying it out for us and is telling you, you know, how you are to be as a Christian. So look at Titus chapter number three and look at verse number two. This is what we're going to focus on. It's why it's the verse of the week. The Bible has some... It kind of gives us an idea of what it means to be gentle here because it tells us what the opposite of gentle is. Look at verse number two. It says, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but, so it now gives us the opposite, right? So it says us these two bad things, and then it says, but instead, be this way. And it says, be gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. So meekness there is also one of the fruits of the Spirit. I'm probably not going to do a whole sermon series on that because I kind of covered that in the pride sermon in Hosea chapter number seven. But meekness is humility. It's humbleness. Okay. So it's saying be gentle instead of, you know, being this person that speaks evil of no man and not being a brawler. So there's two characteristics there 
that are, the Bible's calling out as kind of the opposite of being gentle. So you're like, well, am I gentle or am I not gentle? Well, which of this verse describes you? And notice how it says twice in this verse. Look at the first part of the verse where it says, speak evil of only the people that you don't like. It says, speak evil of no man. There's two all-encompassing statements when it's talking about who we are to be this way to. Look, it's not complicated at least. It may be hard for you to do, but at least it's not complicated. At least you can look at it and say, okay, I don't have to sit here and put all these people in different categories and figure out who I should be you know, nice to and who I should speak evil of and all these different things. It says, no, speak evil of no man. And then it shows, and, and on the flip side of that coin, it says, but, but who should I be gentle to though? Speak evil, okay, but who should I be? Should I be gentle to everyone? It says, showing all meekness, gentle, showing all meekness to all men. I mean, it's not hard to figure this out. This is how you're supposed to be to who? To everybody. It's that simple. All right. So again, turn to James chapter number one, keep your place in Titus chapter number three, because we're going to come back to that. That's going to be our core verse for the sermon. All right. Go to James chapter number one. Now, before we begin, let me just cover, you know, my bases here and say, so I, I'm supposed to be gentle all the time. I'm supposed to be just this gentle guy that just gets run over by everybody in my life. Doesn't stand up for anything. It's just this, you know, just, I mean, no is the answer to that. All right, look at James chapter number one and look at verse number 19 just to get some context here. It says, wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. So again, when we talked about temperance, you know, it's not that you're never going to get angry. It's not that you always have to be gentle or you're always supposed to be gentle. It says, you know, again, slow to wrath is the example I used in last week's sermon on temperance. It's not like you just can never be angry about anything. That would be a terrible person that never got angry at anything. And just in the same manner, this fruit of the spirit gentleness you would basically be a terrible man, especially if you were just gentle all the time and there was never any time where you weren't gentle. But let me again give you this methodology of the fruits of the Spirit here. What we are talking about is how you are known in general. Or, I'm going to put it a different way this morning, the default state of a Christian. The default state. Now look. Turn to Luke chapter number 9. Turn to Luke chapter number 9. Let's just talk about this for a second. This is what a lot of people are missing today. What are you talking about, Pastor, the default state? Well, in Luke chapter number 9, Jesus kind of gives this overview. He gives this concept to James and John. Look at Luke chapter number 9. Look at verse number 53. So these people didn't receive him. They didn't want to hear the gospel. They didn't want to hear what Jesus had to say. They didn't believe him. And right away, James and John are like, let's destroy this place. Like, it's no good. They're not getting saved. They didn't get saved today. They're not going to get saved. Let's, let's just, like, airstrike this thing. Let's go. Look at verse number 53 of Luke chapter number 9. It says, And they did not receive him, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, like, you go to neighborhoods like this all the time. You'll go to neighborhoods, they just don't receive you. You're just like, this is a really unreceptive neighborhood. You go to neighborhoods where they do receive you. All right. And when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, will thou command that we command, uh, will thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. He's, he's saying, you know what he's saying to them? He's like, No, no, no. You're misunderstanding Christianity. <laughs> it's basically what he just told them. He's like, You're misunderstanding what this is all about. He's like, you are not supposed to have this spirit towards people. So the answer is, what is the default state that a Christian should have? And that's what the fruits of the spirit are talking about. So your default state as a Christian should be gentleness. Does that mean that you should never have a time when you're not gentle? Does that mean that there's never a time when you're not temperate and you actually get angry or upset? No, the Bible says that there is righteous anger. The Bible says that there are cases, and even with gentleness, even with gentleness, the point of the, the, this concept in the Bible is this, and this is what Jesus is explaining 
in Luke chapter number 9. The default, Jesus said this to Peter too. When Peter drew his sword and cut the ear off of the Roman soldier, Jesus explained this to Peter too. He's like, that's not, that's not your, he, what are you saying to Peter is, that's not what your purpose is here. That's not what your best use of your life is here. That's not the spirit that you should be of. You are supposed to be of a different spirit. So look, the default for the Christian is nonviolence. That's the default. But, I mean, turn to Exodus chapter number 22. There are cases in the Bible where the Bible says, hey, you don't have to be nonviolent in this case. There are cases for, you know, situations where gentleness is not what is called for. All right? And a perfect example of this in the Bible is self-defense. And I preached a whole sermon on self-defense called The Sword. You can go ahead and watch that if you want. But basically, that's why the Bible has to say, hey, in this case, it's okay. Look at Exodus chapter number 22. Why? Because the default is nonviolence for the Christian. That's the spirit that you should be of. Look at Exodus 22 and verse number 2. We see an example of this here. It says, if a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die... There shall be no blood shed for him. So this is saying that if a thief is found breaking up, like, you know, if somebody breaks into your house, that's what the Bible is saying here. And he be smitten. So if somebody breaks into someone's home and that person kills that thief, then there shall be no blood shed for him. But we get some more additional detail here. And this is really interesting because this is actually a concept that is in our laws today. And all these guys, all the guys today at this church are very um, in tune to what self-defense laws are today for good reason. But the self-defense laws, even in California in this area, are very biblical. Look at verse number, um, verse number three, Exodus 22 and verse number three. The Bible says, if the sun be risen upon him. So that right there assumes that that kind of gives us that additional detail that verse number two was in the dark. So verse number two was at night. So it's basically saying in verse number two that if you're like, man, the Bible's detailed. Yes, the Bible's very detailed. The Bible is literally saying that if somebody breaks into your house at night, it's okay that you would kill him, that you would kill that, that thief or whatever. All right, I'm going to explain that in a second. But look at verse three. If the sun be risen upon him, now we're seeing the other side of it, there shall be, there shall be blood shed for him, for he should make... If the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him, for he should make full restitution. If he have nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. So it's saying that you can kill them in the dark, but you can't kill them in the daytime. You know, he should be sold. He should just make restitution. And the answer, why is that, by the way, that the Bible would say that? Because is it clear what somebody's doing in the dark? If somebody broke into your house in the dark, I think I had this... Um, wrong here. Let me just check something really quick. If um, yes, so basically, like what it's saying is, if somebody breaks into your house in the dark, there's no way for you to know the intentions there. That's what the Bible is trying to say. All right. So the Bible is saying there's no way for you to know the intentions because if somebody breaks in in the dark, you don't know what they're doing. You don't know what they have in their hands. You don't know what their intentions are. They could be there to kill somebody. They could be there to harm somebody. So you have the right to defend yourself. It's explaining self-defense is what it is, all right? Now look at verse, um, go to Proverbs, or actually go to Luke chapter number 22. But, I mean, the theory here is this, and this theory holds true today, holds true even in California. You know, it might surprise people, but basically you shouldn't kill somebody that's just stealing from you. So if there's a situation where you come out in your driveway and somebody is stealing your car, and this is even the, the case in California, and somebody's, you know, stealing uh, some, I was going to say CDs or something out of your car, but nobody has that anymore. But I mean, you know, if somebody's stealing from, you know, a gnome out of your lawn or something, you can't just go out and just start blasting at them, right? I mean, because they're just stealing from you, all right? Now, if somebody robs you at gunpoint or something like that, that's a different story because there's a deadly threat there. You know, you don't know if they're going to kill you or not. You know, at that point, the Bible would be for self-defense in that case. But the point is, look at Luke chapter 22, verse number 36. Basically, unless your life is in danger, 
You know, you shouldn't use deadly force is what the Bible is talking about here. All right. It says that's uh, look at verse number 36 of Luke chapter number 22. Then he said unto them, but now he that hath a purse, let him take it and likewise his strip. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. So now Jesus is sending the disciples out to preach the gospel after he's going to leave. And he's telling them, look, you're going to need to be able to defend yourself. He literally tells them to go buy a sword. All right. This is, you know, just an example of, you know, we should be a default, gentle, nonviolent person as a Christian. But there are cases where the Bible clearly says you have the right to defend yourself. All right. Another example of, you know, just an exception here is on, you know, what the Bible teaches. And I'm not going to go into detail on this because we're going to get into this on the Bible family. But another example of this is how the Bible teaches in Proverbs that, you know, you should spank your children. You know, it gives that it's like, no, you should default to gentleness, but it gives this exception like, well, you should spank your children, though. And I'll talk about what that is and what that isn't in a couple of weeks. But the point is, is that the Bible has to kind of give that exception because left alone, Christians default to gentleness. Most people wouldn't do it if the Bible didn't say like, hey, you should do this. All right. It's because the default, again, for the Christian that is following the spirit is gentleness, is nonviolence. All right. So that's the spirit that Jesus is talking about in um, when he was talking to in Luke chapter number nine. Go back to Titus chapter number three, if you would. Let's look at what the opposite is now of gentleness. All right. So we see that you don't have to be gentle all the time. It's just the default that you should be. There are Bible cases, especially the case of defending people that you love, defending your family, defending um, your friends, defending your own life, where the Bible literally says, like, no, you don't have to be gentle in this case. All right. Go back to Titus chapter number three and look at verse number two. Titus chapter number three, look at verse number two. The Bible says this. It says, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. So it gives us two things here that are the opposite of being gentle. So now that we know gentleness is the default, go back to Romans chapter number 16, if you would. The first one is speaking evil. So an answer or an opposite, sorry, of gentleness is speaking evil of people. All right. Now, again, there are exceptions here. Look at Romans chapter number 16. And by speaking evil, what is it talking about? It's talking about you know, speaking hurtful things, speaking something that is not nice or har that is harmful to other people, all right? Something that's not necessarily positive, all right? Now, look, Romans 16 has a slight exception to this, that you could just never say anything that is negative about anybody. The Bible says in Romans 16, 17, it says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. All right. So look, the Bible here is saying in Romans chapter number 16, and I'm going to talk about this in much greater detail tonight, this specific verse, um, what it means and what it doesn't mean. And this is talking about marking people to the church here, people that are causing division amongst a church, people that just don't like the church. Like, and this is going to happen. It's going to be necessary. People that don't like the church. I hate to break it to you, but there's going to be people here that come in here and they don't like me. All right. They don't like me and they want to hurt me and they want to say bad things about me. Look, it happens. OK, it happens. And in that case, the Bible is saying that those people need to just be identified so other people don't, you know, get divided or get offended by those people. All right. But it says speak no evil. Other than that, it says speak no evil of no man. So there is this slight exception here, but you say, well, what if, what if somebody doesn't like me personally? You know, what if somebody doesn't like me? What if, here, here's one, what if I don't like somebody personally? What if I have a personal enemy or you have a personal enemy, but look, the Bible says speak no evil. That's what the Bible says. Aside from somebody causing division in the church, the Bible says speak no evil. It doesn't say unless, you know, you don't like them. It doesn't say unless, you know, they don't like you. Then you can say whatever evil thing that you want. And look, let's look at the next 
the next part of Titus chapter 3 and verse number 2, and then I'll speak more about this. It says, to be no brawlers. So speak evil, speak evil of no man. And we see that there's a slight exception there when it comes to people causing division in the church in Romans 16. Because look, all the Bible, all the Bible must be true together. So you must take every verse in the Bible and it says, okay, but you can mark people in this case, but speak no evil of no man. It, you know, it's, you have to take it all together and take it all in context, all right? That all has to be true together. But again, gentleness is the default state. And if you're not a gentle person, the Bible says you're a brawler. Don't be a brawler. Instead, be gentle, all right? So Exodus chapter 22, other places in the Bible, we see self-defense is an exception to that. But the problem is, is that people in their Christian lives that are in the flesh, they get this idea that my enemies, turn to Proverbs chapter number 25, Proverbs chapter number 25, my enemies, I must get them. My enemies, I have these people that I don't like, and they don't like me, and I got to get them. Like Romans 20 says this. Romans 20 is kind of, you know, uh, basically quoting Proverbs 25. So let's just go to Proverbs chapter number 25. Proverbs chapter number 25, and look at verse number 21. This is a verse that I, I think that a lot of people would just like to not remember in the Bible sometimes. Look at this in Proverbs 25, 21, something that is also repeated by Paul in Romans chapter number 20. The Bible says this, if thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. What in the world? If he be thirsty, give him water to drink. And you're going to keep your place there in Proverbs chapter 25 and verse number 21, all right? Because we're going to go back to that in a second. So God is telling you if thine enemy, so what's he saying? He's talking to you personally. He's not saying if, you know, our, you know, it's not plural. He's talking to a, a person. He's saying, if thine enemy, so it's basically like, if your enemy, if your enemy, if your enemy, you know, is thirsty, give him water. If he's hungry, give him bread to eat, give him water to drink. If he be hungry, feed him, all these things. You say, why in the world would God tell me to be nice to my personal enemies? I'm going to tell you two reasons why, all right? And it's very practical. It's very practical why God gives this type of advice to us, all right? So God, you got to think about it from... You know, obviously God is so much higher than us, but it's easy kind of to put ourselves, you know, if we could just look down at this mess of, you know, human nature. I mean, if you can't kind of like look at the mess of human nature, you know, throughout history, even now today uh, amongst Christians and understand like why God puts things in place, uh, you know, you need to try to do that. There's two reasons God says this. All right. The first reason is this. In many cases between people. In many cases, between, even between Christians, between Christian A and Christian B, everyone is wrong. <laughs> you know, we kind of need to get rid of, like, I think one of the biggest logical faults that people have in their life is they're binary thinkers. They want to think that, okay, these are the good guys and these are the bad guys. When many cases, these people did a bunch of wrong things over here and these people did a bunch of wrong things over here. No one's right. So that's why God is saying, like, amongst your personal enemies, Christian, just like, don't speak evil, don't do evil. He's just saying, be nice. Give him bread to eat, give him water to drink. Turn to Romans chapter number 12. Turn to Romans chapter number 12, if you would. Let's look at another one, Romans chapter number 12. So the first reason is, is that many times God knows, God knows us. God knows us as human beings. Look at Romans chapter 12. And look at verse number 17. The first reason that God tells us to do this in Proverbs 25, to be good to your enemies, to love your enemies, other places in the Bible, is that many times when you have enemies, both you and your enemy are wrong. That's why. The second reason is this. Look at Proverbs, or look at Romans chapter number 12, and look at verse number 17. The Bible says recompense to, again, here it is, no man. Evil for evil. That is implying that some man did evil to you. That is implying that someone has done or said something evil to you. It's saying recompense not back at them. It's very similar, a very similar concept to what he's saying in Proverbs 25. And you kept your place in Proverbs 25, right? Because we're going to go back there. All right. In verse number 18, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Look, He's, he's even acknowledging how hard this is to do here. 
He's even acknowledging how hard it is when somebody does evil to you, how you just, you, you, you want to, like, man, you want to just, like, you want to get them. You want to get them back, right? He's saying, don't do that. Look at verse number 20. Therefore, and, and here again, we see, you know, the um, kind of the, the, the other side or the, the quotation of Proverbs 25. He says, therefore, dearly beloved, um, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And then verse number 20 is basically Proverbs chapter 25. So, but he's saying, so the second reason is this. First reason is that God tells us this advice is because many times both people are wrong. And the second reason is because God's like, vengeance is mine. Like, I will take care of it. I will, you know, repay. All right. And, but look back at, or just go to verse number 20, because that's basically what Proverbs 25 says. But look at verse number 20. So the answer is this. The answer is this. Look, and by the way, so he's saying many pe both people are wrong in many cases, so be good to your enemies. He's just trying to manage this sinful group of people down here, even this sinful group of Christians. But then he's saying, vengeance is mine. So like, you're like, yeah, but I got to get them. Like, like, no, he's like, if they're wrong, I'll get them. That's what God's saying. It's like nobody's going to get away with anything, especially Christians. They're all going to be chastised on this earth. That's it. God's like, I'll just take care of it. So like li literally not obeying this and not listening to this is a lack of faith, which, by the way, is another fruit of the spirit. So he's saying, even though your flesh wants to do this because of the fact that both could be wrong and I will repay, I will, God's saying, I will be the judge. When there's this big conflict, especially between two Christians, God's like, I will be the judge of it. Don't go. And he's like, you just, if both people just did no evil, like all these things, like these, all these conflicts would just melt away. All these problems would just go away. But this is, by the way, this is why people, because of these Bible verses right here, where God gives us this advice to love our enemies, do good to them that hate you, be, you know, not recompense evil for evil. It's because of this. This is why people make their enemies evil God-haters. This is why they do that, because it's an incentive. It's an incentive for them to make their enemies also enemies of God, and then we can attack them now that they're enemies of God. But there's real moral hazard here. There's moral hazard here, because what you're just, if you just think about this for a second, what you're actually doing is you are not only degrading your personal enemy to a lower level, but you're actually elevating yourself to God's level. There is real moral danger there. There's real moral danger there. Because if you just say, like, you know, well, all my enemies are God's enemies, you've just equated yourself with God to a degree. And, you know, it's a, there's a moral hazard. And there's an incentive because of these verses to, that's what I mean by moral hazard. There's an incentive for someone who wants to be in the flesh to do this. Because then you can attack. Then you can, you know, go over the top with your enemies. All right? But look, look at the next verse. Look at verse number 20 of Romans 12. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. And, and what you do when you do that is you make yourself a sinner even in a situation where maybe you did nothing wrong. And now you're a sinner in the situation. Look at the next verse, though. Look at the next verse. It says, Therefore, if thy enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him to drink. For in doing so, look at this, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. And in Proverbs chapter 25, I'll just read it to you. I'll just read it to you. The Bible says, For thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head, in verse number 22. But then look what it says at the end of that verse. It says, And the Lord shall reward thee. So what's the best thing to do when someone's doing evil to you, speaking evil of you? What's the best thing to do? Uh, you know, nothing. Live your life. That, that's the best thing to do. And let me tell you something. There, there's even, like, again, this is a law. This is a spiritual law that, like, is real. So much so that secular people have realized it. There was a, a quote from a cent, uh, 16th century poet if you've ever heard this, this statement, it was from a, uh, I looked up the statement. I've heard the phrase so many times, 
in my life, but there's this phrase. How many of you heard the phrase, living well is the best revenge? Have you heard that? That was a 16th century poet named George Herbert, but basically it's Romans 12, verse number 20. Because when somebody's speaking evil of you, when somebody's doing evil to you, and you just go and you just like, you don't do evil back, God rewards you. God blesses you for that. God gives, if you remember my Red Hot Preaching Sermon, God gives you peace at home. God gives you peace in your life. And you know what? That means you live well. So, I mean, I wouldn't say that that's doctrine, living well is the best revenge, but it's basically a paraphrase of what the Bible is actually telling us to do. And all it takes is staying in the Spirit. Now, let me just kind of give you some advice here, because this is something, uh, this is something that throughout my life, I have, like, I have a very certain, I have a very specific type of personality. And there's, very, there's a lot of detrimental aspects of the specific type of personality that I have. And I'm aware of those things, and I try to mitigate those things. But one of the good things about the personality that I have is I, when it comes down to, when it comes down to somebody that I don't know, somebody that is out in the, you know, the, the ether out there that maybe doesn't like me or is even speaking evil about me. I mean, I've always been this way. I, I just, I don't care. Like, I don't care at all. And I wish I could make more people like that. And I wish I could make people that I love, that are around me, more like that. Look, and there's detrimental sides of that, you could say, because a lot of times that will come off. And, like, this is one of those things where, like, knowing yourself and knowing this about yourself is very important. Because a lot of times, like, having that personality trait and having that aspect about myself can come off as insensitivity. It can come off to people like, I don't care. And that's not the case, that I don't care about people in this church or people in my family or whatever. As a matter of fact, like when it came to like people thinking, as long as my wife knows who I am, as long as my children know who I am, as long as people in this church know who I am, I mean, I'm good. Like literally. That's why, that's why we don't have um, YouTube comments. Because... There was, like, there, every now and then there'd be negative things that were said, and, and, like, Garrett was a young kid when he was doing, like, our YouTube ministry, and, like, a lot of times there'd be inappropriate things that came up. And as far as, like, look, I'm, I'm thankful that people watch the sermons, and I get emails that are very encouraging, uh, you know, on a regular basis. That's all great. I love that. Thank you for all that. But as far as, like, somebody outside in the ether, what they think of the sermon, if they like it or don't like it, I mean, I don't mean to be insensitive, but, like, I literally just, like, have 0% care about that. I mean, it sounds mean, but like, I just, I don't think about it. I don't worry about it. It doesn't even, it's something that doesn't register in my, my weird head. I've never been this type of person in high school, junior high, or whatever that needed to fit into this group or that group or this group. I was just, I was always kind of friends with the people I wanted to be friends with in these different groups. And some people I didn't like, and some people liked me, and some people I like. you know, it just, it, it was, I just never had that. And... I wish I could make more people like that. And look, maybe, maybe if I spent a bunch of my life, like, just inner entangled in, in this, like, you know, negativity that's out there, maybe I would develop that. I don't know. But, like, I just, I don't care about it. And I don't mean that to be insensitive, but I wish I could pass that on to more people. Because if somebody is upset at you, as long as, as, that, as, long as it's not... Like, because if your wife is upset at you or your husband is upset at you, there may be like a godly reason that that is happening and that that relationship needs to be repaired, all these things. But as far as people that you don't have a relationship with, like being upset at you, I don't even know how that's possible, but whatever, whatever. And I wish more people could be like that. You know, I think that, you know, this Christianity would be a better place to be if more people, if I could just dump that. Just that one part of my, you know, messed up personality on other people, I wish it could be that one that I could put on people, all right? Because just live your life. Like, you know, why are you, why do you not look at, I mean, look, I, I'm, I have a life to live out here. I'm living a life. I'm, I mean, we got a church family here. We're doing all kinds of stuff outside the church. October's just like insaneville with just church activities, 
And then I have this thing, what's it called? A family where I like, I, we spend time together and we do things together and all this stuff. But like, that's real. Like they're in front of me. I can like, you know, pick them up and go like this and whatever. It's real. It's not this fake world. Okay. Which is like, honestly, it's a fake representation of, of who people are anyway, in my opinion. But live well is the best revenge. I mean, not, you shouldn't want revenge, but there's some truth to that because when there's people that are attacking you and you're just like, like, what, what, huh? And like somebody, like, it's always like a third hand person that tells me stuff anyway. And it's like, oh, okay, whatever. But it, it, it just heaps coals of fire on those people because like they want to get in a, in a fight and an argument and people live for this stuff. Un unfortunately, it's not Christian. There's nothing Christian about it. There's nothing in the spirit about it. There's nothing gentle about it. As a matter of fact, it's the opposite of gentleness. It is just people that want to brawl and speak evil. All right? So, gentleness. Gentleness. You say, I'm not gentle. All right? Now, here's the application part of the sermon. All right? You say, I'm not gentle. I want to be gentle. I should be a more gentle person. Well, turn to Isaiah chapter number 40. The God, God tells us how we can be Gentle, and he gives us his own example. All right, look at Isaiah chapter number 40. Look, to become gentle, if you're not a gentle person, if you're somebody that just, you know, speaks evil of people and you're a gossip and you just like have to like get involved in things and speak bad things about people and you're just like an angry person all the time and all this, it, it takes temperance. You see how these fruits of the Spirit kind of build on each other? It takes temperance. You have to do these things on purpose. Right? You can literally, you know, if you're saved today, you can literally change who you are. You can change problems with your character. You don't have to just say, oh, this is just who I am. No, that's why the Bible is telling you to have these fruits of the Spirit. It wouldn't tell you these things if you just are who you are. As a Christian, there's nothing that you can't get past. All right? Look at Isaiah chapter number 40. Look at verse number 10. You've got to do this on purpose. If you're not gentle and you want to become gentle. But here's the thing. You say, oh, I don't know, gentleness sounds weak and all this. No, gentleness takes strength. Yep. Look at Isaiah chapter number 40, because God is gentle. You call him God weak? Look at Isaiah chapter number 40 and verse number 10. It says, behold, now who is the example we're looking at here? The Lord God will come with a what? A strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him, he shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom, and he shall gently lead those that are with young. Notice how God describes himself here. I mean, that is a great couple of verses that are together right there. Notice how God describes himself. He says, I have a strong hand. I work hard. I'm taking care. Look, you should all apply this to your family. You know, I mean, look, it takes strength. It takes strength, men, and you men know this, but it takes strength to provide for your family. Like, real physical strength. I mean, I can tell when it is hot out in the summertime. I can tell with the guys coming into the church. I can see it in the countenance in their faces. When there's been three weeks of 114 degree temperatures, I can see it because that takes physical strength. That takes mental fortitude to go out and provide for your family no matter what the environment no matter what's going on, no matter what the people at work are doing, no matter what kind of people they just, what kind of new crew they just brought in, whatever that is, it takes strength to stick with that and to just do it. It takes physical, mental, and spiritual strength to do that. Look, it takes strength to raise your kids properly, ladies. I mean, there's days when every lady is thinking to themselves, I can't do this. I can't teach these kids. You know, these kids aren't listening to me or what's going on, and they just don't feel like they're doing the best job that they could do. But look, it takes strength to continue on through days like that. It takes physical strength, mental strength, and especially spiritual strength. Look, weakness tempts you. Weakness tempts you. You'd be like, oh, man, you know, 
the world is doing things different. It could be easier if I just put my kids in school. It'd be easier if I put my kids in school. We'd have more money if we put the kids in school. I mean, I wouldn't have all this stress on me if we put, I mean, the stress will be later. I mean, live on one income? Look, that takes actual, real, spiritual strength. It takes a lot of faith. And look, you know what? It can be a hard sell for people. This Christian life can be a hard sell to people when you tell them, you know what, you're going to have to be stronger than you are now. You're going to have to have more faith than you have now. You're going to have to work harder than you work now. You know, you get some family that comes in here, just got saved, and they want to get things on the right track. I mean, hey, you're going you're gonna to have to work more hours. Things are going to get harder for you, Mom. You have this responsibility of teaching the Word of God to these children from the time they wake up to the time they lay down. You're going to have less. You know, they're like, what's the benefit here? But look, this takes fortitude to do this. That's why God is saying, I, I am a strong hand. I have a strong, you know, arm to protect you. Look, it takes toughness. It takes toughness. But through all that, turn to Luke chapter 15. Through all that toughness that God has towards us and that we need to have towards our family, how does God lead? He leads gently. Through that toughness, through that fortitude, that's how we are to lead. Look at Luke chapter 15. Look, it uses this example in Isaiah chapter 40 that is used many other places in the Bible of a shepherd, of a shepherd protecting the flock. Remember in 1 Samuel chapter 17, David said, I killed a lion and I killed a bear. Why? Because they took a lamb out of the flock. So David put himself in danger and he had that strength and that toughness to go out and defend the flock. That's what a shepherd does. Look at Luke 15, verse number 3. He spake a parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And we have found it, he layeth on his shoulders, rejoicing. Look, a real shepherd, when one is lost, will risk life and limb to find the one. But go back to verse number 11 of Isaiah chapter number 40. So this shepherd, look, to be a shepherd, this is, you can't be a slouch and be a shepherd. That's what the point I'm trying to make. Yet in verse number 11, what does it say? Look down at your Bible. This strong shepherd who would lift, you know, risk everything for just one of the flock shall also do this and shall gently lead those that are with young. He, he will lead gently. It takes strength to lead gently. See, it's the weakling that has no temperance. It's the weakling that's just a brawler all the time. It's the weakling that, you know, is just doesn't follow any of the fruits of the spirits. It's like, no, you need to fight when you need to fight to protect the flock. And when you're through that battle, you lead with gentleness. This is how it works. That's God. And he's showing us, he's like, you know what? That's a Bible leader right there. I, I don't know how you can't, I don't know how you could read the Bible and not understand this. It's, it's alarming. See, and that's the irony of many of the fruits of the Spirit especially with gentleness. See, it's easy to get in the flesh. And that's why God is warning us about this. But gentleness is born out of strength. And that's what God is explaining to us. Gentleness. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.